Ja, willkommen zurück heute hier von unserer heimischen Terrasse. Wir hoffen, euch hat das letzte Video zum Thema Mikroplastik und Plastikmüll im Meer gut gefallen und äh, ihr konntet einiges daraus lernen. Heute wollen wir den Bogen nochmal schlagen zur Insel Giglio, wo das Institut für Marine Biologie beheimatet ist, an dem wir sonst auch viel arbeiten und auch unterrichten. Und wie der eine oder andere sich vielleicht ändern kann, hat Giglio natürlich eine ganz besondere Verbindung zu Umwelteinflüssen im Meer in der jüngeren Geschichte. Und das wollen wir heute ein bisschen näher beleuchten, was da passiert ist in der Vergangenheit und was sich daraus entwickelt hat und warum das auch für Meeresbiologen wichtig und interessant war. Im Stil des letzten Videos wollen wir euch heute auch wieder zwei wissenschaftliche Studien vorstellen, die zu dem Thema ja, menschliche Einflüsse oder gerade der Einfluss der, der letzten Ereignisse in Giro und Meeresbiologie stehen, um euch das Ganze so ein bisschen von der wissenschaftlichen Basis näher zu bringen. Viel, Viel Spaß! Spaß. Ja, wir hoffen, ihr fandet das interessant und damit wir in Zukunft, auch wenn die ganze Krise wieder vorbei ist, die Möglichkeit haben, auch vor Ort äh, Meeresbiologie zum Anfassen durchzuführen, schaut euch auch nochmal die GoFundMe-Aktion des IFMB an und äh, unterstützt die gerne auch einfach durch ein Like oder durch ein Share der ganzen Aktion. Ja, auch Aufmerksamkeit ist eine wichtige Sache. Isra del Giulio, a true gem at the coast of Tuscany. This little island is not only the home of the EFMB, the Institute for Marine Biology, but also a true insider tip for scuba divers and marine biology enthusiasts. The island of Giulio is located in the Tyrrhenian Sea, at the west coast of Italy and belongs to the Tuscanian archipelago. In total, there are seven Tyrrhenian islands, and the legend goes that they were formed as the Tyrrhenian goddess Venus rose from the water and lost her pearl necklace. The necklace fell and broke in seven fragments, which are now the islands Gorgona and Capraia in the north, Elba, the biggest island, Pianosa and Monte Cristo, which you might have heard of as it's the namesake for the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, and on the southern end, Giglio and the second smallest Tuscanian island, Gianutri. Giulio lays about 18 kilometers western from the Monte Argentario Peninsula and has a coastline of about 28 kilometers. There are three main villages on the island, Giulio Porto, located on the eastern side, which has the only true port, Giulio Castello, the main village at an altitude of 405 meters and according to the private association I Borti Più Bella Italia, one of the most beautiful villages in Italy, and lastly Giulio Campese, on the western side of the island. Here in Campese, you can also find the private marine biology institute EFMB. This institute was founded in 1988 by Dr. Klaus Valentin and since 2016, marine biologist Dr. Jenny Tucek is the owner of the EFMB. The Campese Bite is characterized by its two landmarks, the Fara Leone, a prominent rock formation on its southern end, and the old Medici Tower next to the small harbor. For a long time, Giulio was rather a hidden gem, one of the places that only few people knew and where you always had to explain where it's located at. But on the evening of January 13th, 2012, this changed overnight and the tiny island ended up in the spotlight of worldwide media. In the evening hours of that day, the cruise ship Costa Concordia left the harbor in Civitavecchia and passed the island's east coast at about 9.45 in the evening. Here, it collided with a rock formation close to the shore, which tore open a 50-meter gash on the port side of her hull. Soon, parts of the engine room flooded, cutting power from the engines and ship services. With water flooding in and the ship listing, she drifted back towards the island and grounded near shore, then rolled onto her starboard side, lying in an unsteady position on a rocky underwater ledge. A huge boulder of several meter length got stuck on her hull, And even one and a half years after the accident, one could still see and recognize the impact site underwater. Today, the free area is completely overgrown again. And besides the memorial plate, which was put up in memoriam for the 32 people who lost their life that night, almost nothing remains on the tragic events of January 2013. This, however, looks very different on the wreck site. The goal of the salvaging was to remove the wreck as one without dismantling it on site. During this unique operation, the wreck was first lifted up to a vertical position through a power buckling process, and huge caissons were added to it so it finally floated again. After that, the team was able to transport it to the port of Genua in July 2014 for the final shipwrecking. 
But the operations on the wreck site continued for several more months until all traces of the salvaging were removed. Until today, it is not allowed for recreational divers to dive in the immediate area, but the entire procedure provided a unique study opportunity for marine biologists. That's why we want to tell you about two scientific publications today, which revolve around the research that has been conducted on the impacts of the Costa Concordia wreck on the marine environment in Gilio Island. For the first study, Effects of Costa Concordia Shipwreck on Epiphytic Assemblages in Biotic Features of Posidonia Oceanica Canopy, the scientists assess the percentage cover of algae and animal taxa that are living on the leaves of the endemic seagrass species Posidonia Oceanica, just after the shipwreck until its removal from the impacted site. In the case of Posidonia Oceanica, being endemic means it can be only found in the Mediterranean Sea. The scientists put a special focus on seagrass, as Posidonia oceanica has been shown to be an effective bio indicator to assess the health status of marine coastal environments. Posidonia meadows have traditionally been considered to act as sinks for particles due to the reduction of flow velocities by the plant canopy. As the canopy slows down water currents, particles, nutrients and pollutants are trapped from the water column. This is also an important feature when it comes to the accumulation of plastic debris in benthic habitats. If you want to know more about this, please check also our previous videos on marine plastic pollution. The biotic features of Posidonia oceanica reflect the physiological state of the canopy, but may also reflect the quality of the surrounding environment. An increase in senescence, tip erosion and other biometric features of the leaves can therefore help to identify possible changes in water transparency and hydrodynamic characteristics. Also epibiotic communities can be an indicator of the ecological quality of coastal waters, as they are more sensitive and react more rapidly than the host plant to changes. Epibions include the epiphytes, meaning other plants, which in the marine realm are algae, and epizoic organisms, mostly sessile animals such as hydrozones, bryozones, ascidians and polychaetes. Increase in the epiphyte biomass, differences in their spatial heterogeneity, shift in their species composition, morphological groups and main taxonomic groups have been observed under human disturbance regimes and can therefore indicate the overall status of the seagrass habitat. For this study, three sampling sites were selected at 10 meter depth along a gradient of increasing distance from the stern of the Costa Concordia wreck. The disturbed site was located at the stern of the wreck and two control sites were selected northwards from the wreck at Cooper Bay and Arenella Bay. All sites were similar to each other with regard to the geomorphology and ecologically similar to the disturbed one as they were all located in enclosed bays and exposed to the same prevailing winds. In science, controls are needed to minimize the effects of variables other than the independent variable. This increases the reliability of the results, often through a comparison between control measurements and the other measurements. In each site, three sampling areas of approximately 5 to 5 meter were randomly selected. The scientists collected five orthotropic shoots at different time points. Just after the shipwreck in July 2012, afterwards in March and July 2013, just before the power buckling, as well as in March 2014 and in July 2014, shortly before the removal of the wreck which took place in August 2014. The scientists assessed the brown senescent tissue length, which are the old and died off parts of the end of the seagrass leaves, and counted broken tips, as an increase in both can give an indication on changes in water transparency and hydrodynamic characteristics. In July 2012, the scientists saw indeed that there were significantly more seagrass leaves with broken tips at the meadow close to the wreck than at the control stations. Also, the senescence tissue length was obviously longer at plants close to the wreck. Both can be identified as a stress marker of the dramatic events a few months earlier. In July 2013, shortly before the power buckling process, even more leaves were broken. However, the senescent tissue length slowly resembles the leaves from the control sites. Also, the results from 2014 look pretty much alike. Many broken tips and in comparison to the control sites, longer senescent tissues at the seagrass plants from the meadow close to the wreck. The scientists assumed that this was the result of changed conditions of the surrounding water, episodic spills and foremost the altered currents in the region due to the presence of the wreck. 
But as I already told you, studies like this don't necessarily focus on the seagrass, the habitat architect, but mainly on the organisms that live between and on the plants. These epivions were analyzed in accordance to different groups. For the epiphytes, the plants, the scientists checked the presence of encrusting and erected algae. For the epizones, the sessile animals on the seagrass leaves, they checked for bryozones, hydrates, foraminifers, spirobetes and acidians. In 2012, it was obvious for both groups, the epiphytes and epizoic organisms, that their abundances were heavily reduced on seagrass plants close to the shipwreck. However, in general, and just checking the broad groups of animals and plants living on the seagrass, the percentage cover in July 2013 was again pretty similar between the wreck and the control sites. And in 2014, they were not, at least statistically, different from each other anymore. This, however, looks quite different once we check the individual groups the scientists differentiated. Let's have a closer look on the results for four of them. Among the epiphytes, it was very obvious that the encrusting red algae of the genus Hytolithion, which are usually covering big proportions of the seagrass leaves, were heavily influenced by the ship accident, at least in the immediate month after the event. For the bryozones, however, the scientists didn't find a statistical difference between the assessed sites, whereas the number of hydrates was clearly reduced at the wreck site when they assessed their status in the first year. The Ascidians cover is displaying a pretty different and astonishing pattern. In July 2013, they were way more abundant at the station close to the wreck than at the control sites. The authors of this paper didn't go into detail on their hypothesis on this phenomenon, but here are my personal thoughts on this. I assume that the different feeding modes in hydrates, whether it's bryozones and Ascidians, explain these differences in their presence or absence in the wreck site. While hydrates require currents for the transport of particles and thus their food, bryozones and ascidians can create water movements by themselves and are less dependent on the water currents. Why do I think this could have been the reason for them being more or less abundant? Well, scientists assume that the presence of the wreck significantly changed the flow conditions in the area. Without constant water movement, passively feeding animals like hydrates are getting into trouble because of food deficiency. While actively feeding animals like bryozones or ascidians are less impacted, because they can swirl water and food independently from external currents. This could have been an advantage during the situation. Another interesting assumption is that the wreck could have served as an artificial reef, providing 10,000 square meters of precious settling space for all kinds of larvae. This suddenly available space could have changed the colonization patterns in the seagrass meadow by lowering the competition between organisms. This means it could have been that the epivions could have settled on the wreck instead of the seagrass leaves. In summary, the scientists found that the disaster had an influence on both the epibiotic community of the seagrass meadow and the biotic factors of the seagrass. They saw that despite of chemicals occasionally leaking from the wreck, this impact was rather temporal and with reversible effects. And it is indicated that the mere presence of the wreck, by acting as a physical barrier for waves and currents, changed the natural hydrodynamic traits of the area. This could as well have an impact on the organisms living in and on the seagrass. The second scientific publication we want to present to you deals with microplastic pollution after the removal of the Costocordia wreck. If you are interested in a short introduction on the general topic, check also our videos on marine plastic pollution. In this study, scientists investigated two marine communities. First, different commercially important fish species, which they caught on two stations, one close to the wreck and at one control station on the other side of the island. And second, Mutilus galloprovincialis, the typical Mediterranean blue mussel. These mussels were kept in cages, also close to the Concordia and at a distant control station. The scientists extracted the plastic particles from the digestive system of the fishes and the soft tissues of the bivalves. The extracted particles were then observed with a microscope, photographed and measured and put in categories according to both 
size classes with biggest sizes of 1 to 5 mm and the smallest ones smaller than 0.1 mm and by their shapes, meaning if they were fragments, films, pellets or lines. Microplastics were present in 85% of the 41 examined fish, independently of the species and collection area. This means that microplastic ingestion is a widespread phenomenon on Gilio Island. The typical benthic fishes in the region, scorpion fishes, fogbeards and stargazers, had plastic particles in around 80% of all sampled specimens, while the scientists found in 100%, meaning in all investigated specimen of the black sea bream microplastics. Microplastics were recently extracted in 18 to 28 of large pelagic and commercial fish species of the Mediterranean Sea. The high occurrence of microplastics in fish from Gilio may therefore reflect the elevated levels of these particles in the Mediterranean basin, but also the close proximity of catching areas to the shoreline, which is an important sink compartment for microplastics, particularly in highly touristic and anthropogenized areas. After the end of activities for the Costa Concordia removal, some evident differences were observed in terms of number and typology though. For example, fork beards from the wreck site were found to contain five plastic items per individual, while those from the control site contained an average 1.75 particles per fish. And also overall, the mean values of microplastic ingestion in fish sampled from the Costa Concordia wreck area are among the highest reported worldwide. Approximately 23% of positive fish sample close to the wreck had one or two items, 17% had three items, and 60% had ingested more than three particles with a maximum of up to seven. When comparing these results with other studies, this gives definitely evidence for the hypothesis that the wreck area could be considered as seriously impacted by the microplastic pollution. The fish had mainly ingested particles in the size between 0.5 and 1 mm and less of the small size ranges. This could be because larger particles resemble the size class of their natural food source, or in case of predatory species, the food of their prey. In a digestive system of the fish, mainly larger fragments and line pieces were found. For the mussel experiment, the team collected blue mussels from a control site close to Ancona and the Adriatic coast. The mussels were placed in cages close to the wreck and in a control station further south. To distinguish between surface waters and benthic bottom habitats, scientists kept the mussels in different depths, close to the surface in a depth of about 1.5 meter and on the bottom in a depth between 30 and 45 meter. Mussels close to the surface water had taken up all sizes of microplastic particles, however only a small amount of the particles below 0.5 mm were found. This corresponds to the particle sizes typically filtered by the mussels. Besides pellets, all types of microplastics were found with line pieces at the most abundant compartment. In the mussels from the seafloor, mostly larger particles were found and they had only ingested line pieces. The huge differences between the two habitats also show that the hydrodynamic traits of the plastics are very different and depend on size, density and so on. This shows again how complex these processes and connections are. To learn more about the uptake of microplastics in bivalves, check also our video on the experiment with giant clams in the Red Sea. To conclude this, we can say that there is no statistically significant connection between microplastic pollution in benthic habitats and the shipwreck. However, the presence of high amounts of plastic particles from a huge variety of polymers indicate that the salvage operations could have indeed released high amounts of microplastic debris into the environment. The relatively high frequency of fish containing microplastic, even from the control area of Gilio Island, represents a further warning signal for the widespread diffusion of these particles in the Mediterranean and the consequent pressure on marine species and footwebs. Ja, wir hoffen, ihr fandet das interessant und damit wir in Zukunft, auch wenn die ganze Krise wieder vorbei ist, die Möglichkeit haben, auch vor Ort äh, Meeresbiologie zum Anfassen durchzuführen, schaut euch auch nochmal die GoFundMe-Aktion des IFMB an und äh, unterstützt die gerne auch einfach durch ein Like oder durch ein Share der ganzen Aktion. Aufmerksamkeit ist eine wichtige Sache. Und wenn ihr kein Video verpassen wollt, abonniert doch unseren Kanal.